I'm on now. Um, uh, my first announcement has to do with the retreat. I believe all of us have been notified that we are having the retreat on March 5th. Uh, location and times to be decided, which brings me to my next question. Who would like to be on the committee to plan the retreat? Uh, anybody volunteering here? Okay, so Reese is volunteering. Is that, I saw that. All right, it sounds like one of those auctions. Okay, you're going to volunteer. Anyone else want to be on that committee? Okay. Uh, did Hillary, did you raise your hand, Hillary? I, I would be happy to help depending on when the meetings for this are held. Okay, good. All right, so we have that committee. Um, the other thing that I want to ask regarding to the, regarding the retreat is, um, let's see, we have, we don't have a meeting before. I would appreciate it if people, if we just run down the table right now and ask anybody of any topics that they think they would really like to have us include in the retreat. And we'll start with Hillary. Um, I don't know, what can I ask for? Uh, I enjoyed the, when we started to get into some of the roles of commissioners and or trustees, some of the nuts and bolts of what we need to do and what we need not to do. And if we can explore that further, I would appreciate that. Okay. I like the idea of do and not do. Okay. All right. Reese. Well, I agree with Hillary. I really was beginning to really get hooked into that bit about what we're going, what we do and how we relate to the different All right. things we play. Thank you. Barbara. I think this is the same thing, the protocols, developing our protocols, um, how we do things and so forth. And the second thing I'd like to talk about is the labs, the friends, and building a supportive group of library supporters and how we uh, have them be effective and function uh, to the best of their ability. Thank you. Linda? Specifically the Library Foundation. Okay. Uh, yeah, nuts and bolts of being good, of being a good organization. Uh, almost basically what Hillary had to say. Thank you. Other Paul? I agree with Hillary, and um, also the, the foundation is, is important, and uh, and we're we're getting there. I just want to uh, make sure we're all on the same page as go out to the community. And we're getting there, but I'd like to solidify that. Helena? I have nothing to add, because I think that that will be a full day's worth of work, and I agree with all those things. Okay, and uh, uh, Hillary said exactly what I was going to say, only I would uh, talk about the word about establishing our protocols. Uh, so, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, public appearances. Any members of the public uh, wishing to address the commission uh, for items that are not on the agenda? There being none, we'll move on to the library at Void and friends of the library at report. And I believe we have someone here from Windsor. I'm uh, Mike Neely. I'm representing the Windsor Lab. And since we were one of the ones pushing to have the homework help program, I thought we would come and tell you what lessons we learned during the first semester. We think the program has been successful. We've seen progress. Is your mic on? Excuse me. I... Well, push your button down at the bottom. Is there a button down at the bottom? Make a green light. Okay. Um, Is it on that little box? In the oh, go oh. Now can you hear? Okay, yes. that's better. Okay, Thank sorry. You. Sort of Mike Neely from Windsor Lab. Uh, we were pushing for the uh, library, the homework help program, because that's what we got feedback from on when we did a community outreach. So we feel like the program's been successful. We've seen progress in the kids. Not that it's all our doing, but uh, we've also learned some lessons from it. 
primarily what we've seen are primary school children, and even that younger primary school children, the second and third graders, more than anything else. I've had one high school girl, and we had a couple of middle school kids, and they came a couple of times, and then no more. So I guess there's, there's a question in our mind, why aren't we getting more of the other students? Is it that no, we don't offer what they need or what? What we found is that with the younger children, we're busy 3.30 to 4.30, maybe 5 o'clock, because they're tired at that time. They're yawning, heads down. It's hard enough for them to keep concentration as it is. <laughs> But uh, from 5 to 5.30, we get almost no traffic. Just a point for others to... Okay. Uh, as far as how many we can help, we have the table set up in the forum room, and uh, three students is sort of the maximum at a table because otherwise they're not getting any individual attention. And sometimes there will be two of them working on a similar project and you can help them, but if you've got a second grader and a third grader doing different things, it's difficult to do it. And so, okay, that's enough for that one. Um, second, I only wish that we had a room like this. <laughs> we have a forum room which is open and we put the tables around the edges of it. Uh, Six, we have six volunteers right now, and that's about all that we can handle because you wouldn't have more room for desks in there. It's also distracting for the kids. When they start talking, they're, they're easily distracted as it is, and somebody over here is talking, so they're trying to listen to what their buddy is saying. Um, it'd be nice to have better things, but that's, that's it. And we, we don't have room where we are for more tables as it is. Uh, the materials, we've since solved some of the problem, but it would have been useful to have a handout when we started this program to say, here's what's expected of the students at each grade. Uh, we went on the internet and found it and we printed up little, little things because kids come up and they want help, mainly in math seems to be most of our thing, and it, you're trying to tell them something and, oh, I haven't had that yet. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> you're learning multiplication, but you don't know what division is. Well, that's, that's a little interesting. Um, they don't have school books, so they come in there with a torn out sheet from the, their, to do their homework, because apparently the schools can't afford to buy books. And sometimes I'd have to say that those questions are not very clear. We can't even figure out what is needed. <laughs> so, so I'm you know, not surprised that they don't have any problem. Um, okay, so just as a summary here, we think it is helping students. Uh, I, I know this, when we first started, I had a little second grader come in, and uh, we were working on his math, and I thought, oh, well, this is going to be a tough throw, but now he's really doing like that. He does things in his head. He's doing very well, and, and a lot of the others have the same exhibit. Um, mostly, as I say, mostly the primary school students. We don't know why we don't get the other students. You know, whether our outreach wasn't good, whether they don't think that, you know, we're going to be able to help them, I don't know. Uh, and because they are younger students, it is to be the, the early time. So if we could do it twice a week, it would be better. And because a lot of them are trying, some of them are trying to do the homework for the whole week. I guess their teacher gives them the sheets, and they're trying to do it all in one two-hour period. So if we were there twice a week, that might help more. Um, as I say, three students per helper is a maximum. It's better to be two. We have six volunteers, and I would say that they need substitutes because not everyone can come every week, and you also need Spanish speakers. I get by in Spanish, but I'm not great in it, but none of the others do. So, you know, we have kids from Cali Calmec come in there. It's a bilingual school. It would be better if we had people who spoke Spanish. And then, as I say, to need to know what's expected each grade. And that's, that's it, what we've learned so far for this semester. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments or questions from commissioners? Okay. I had a question. Um, you prefaced this by saying that you were, that Windsor was kind of pushing the homework help thing. Right. Where, what, what was the instigation or what? Oh, you know? we, I was, the last time I presented here, we had a, an outreach to the public where we said, well, we're supposed to represent what the public wants, and we don't know because we've never asked them. So we had uh, a session at the, the library where people came in and wrote down on paper and talked about what it is they wanted. And the homework help was the one thing that the lab could do, or could do, you know, provide some of the things. Most of the others were more hours, you know, more days, et cetera, which we don't have any control over. 
Did you get have any trouble finding volunteers? Not really. We had six volunteers, and uh, you know we don't always have six there, but uh, we'll generally have four or five. We get about twelve to fifteen students per week. Are they adults, like retired adults, that are the volunteers, or they... yeah, these are all adults, right? Yeah. It'd be nice if we had some students who come in too. So. But again, you know, it would be nice if we had a, a list of substitutes and then you could plan and say, okay, I can't be there this week. I'm going on vacation or whatever and get somebody else to come in. But yeah. so far, that's, that's just a learning curve. Would it be possible, because now high schoolers have to do volunteer work, yes. to go to the local high school and see if you could get volunteers who could be Spanish speakers and right. of the community to be your substitutes, and that would help the, the youth and also help the community. And uh, if you find out where your students are going to school, you might be able to connect with their teachers to know where they should be. Well, we, we have asked in the high school. And uh, there have been hints that somebody might come, but none of them have showed up yet. <laughs> uh, we did have one high school teacher show up one time and ask. Uh, she had two students who have just come in from Mexico and wanted help in algebra. So I started taking the Khan Academy stuff. And I, at first I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And I thought, I haven't had algebra in 50 years. What am I saying? But I took the, the Khan Academy, and that's okay. And then, but the students never showed up. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we do commission reports, we're moving into the audit. Uh, we have Will here. Is that still on? Yes? Let's try again. Let me see. It's still on? You bet. There it is. Okay. Um, good evening. I apologize this is coming to you a month late. I want to be clear that that's on my workload end, not Brett or Ken's. We had intended to finish this for you last month, and it's completely on my end that we're delayed a month. Um, just quickly, I, I heard a couple comments about Note C needing to be updated. Um, I thought that I had caught all the changes to the JPA and the um, oversight of the Board of Supervisors in Note A. But there's a couple pieces of note C in this draft, page 23, that we're going to have to strike out of the draft in order for you to approve it tonight. That's page 30 of 75 for the packet. Thirty of 76. So in paragraph, in, in note C, paragraph budget and budgetary accounting, we're going to strike the second sentence out. It starts with the County Board of Supervisors. And in the one, two, three, four, fifth line down, right in the middle, we're going to strike out and the Board of Supervisors. Um, I have some areas that I want to address in the financials that are new for this year, specifically GASB 68 compliance, but are there questions that I can address from the Commission first so that I make sure we hit those and that everybody's clear as we move through? None? I okay. had one, but I can't find it, so let's... Well, just, how about if you want to interrupt me when you find it? Yes. Does that work? Okay. I, I had a question. It just um, is on page 22, um, note B, mm -hmm. where it talks about rent expense. Mm -hmm. It just seemed... Rent expense includes some rent that you pay for uh, copiers and leases as well. But the, the placement of it under all the Gatsby things. Oh, you want me to place? It just seemed, it just kind of stood out as like, well, I, I didn't. We can definitely, I, 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 things like that, we could, these are your notes. So we can definitely move it to a place that's more readable. But maybe it should be there, and I'm just reading it wrong. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It could be, I mean. It could be placed anywhere. I mean, we can move it up above so that you flow from new pronouncements right into the estimates comment and then out of that note as well. If you want to move it up, like, so before it, property tax revenue. Oh, maybe. Or right after property tax revenue. Yeah, maybe that would sure. be. Because there it's Gatsby, Gatsby, Gatsby. And I know that those are all. Um... That's an easy move. So let me just write these down. So we're going to have note C. And then 
in rent expense after property tax revenue. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I mean, my first comment is that we, um, we actually, Ken and, Ken and Brett have added in, back in the management's discussion and analysis portion of the financial statements. Um, the MDNA is sort of a, it's intended to be a, a lighter read of the notes to the financial statements um, and a little more readable for the end user to understand what happened during the year and what changes there were between fiscal years. Uh, the MDNA, to give you some history for those commissioners who weren't here previously, back in, gosh, 2008 maybe was the last year that it was in the financial statements. The MDNA is not anything that as auditors we opine on, we give an opinion on. It's strictly written by management and it's meant to be um, informative to the reader and it's really up to management whether it's included or not. Back in 2008, management had decided that it was an abundant amount of work and based on workload, they chose to pull it out of the financial statement report, which we noted in our auditor's report that management elected to omit it, but it still gave you a clean audit opinion because even though it's required, it's not part of the audit and there's no opinion given on it. Um, this year, through a series of communications, it was decided by management to go ahead and put that MDNA back in. So if you were to compare these to last year's financial statements, you'll find that the MDNA is new, but it's not a new GASB standard itself. Um, the, I guess the most important thing I want to talk about are on pages 9, uh, nine and 11 of the, PD, of the financial statements themselves, which might be different than your PDF pages. Do you guys have your page numbers on the bottom? Yes, yeah. we do. Okay. Pardon me? No, my, the, the, my packet number. Commission number. packet number 16. Thanks, Tim. So page number nine is your statement of net position. And page number 11 is your governmental funds balance sheets. Both of these are balance sheets, but they have some significant differences between the two. Um, the largest differences being that for the governmental funds balance sheets, you don't account for long-term liabilities. You only account for short-term liabilities or the use of current resources. And so page nine includes your long-term pension liability and benefit obligations but page 11 does not. You'll notice that uh, kind of right towards the middle of page nine, you'll find your two largest long-term liabilities. Your Kim, net pension. Kim, is that on 16? It's on pa page 16 of the packet. Page Tim, do you want to give me the audit. page numbers in the packet 16. and I'll use those? So yeah, you, it's that's page 16, 16. 76 in the packet. And do they go, and then the, the next one that we're talking about is page 18? Correct. Okay. So page 16 includes um, three long-term liabilities that are not included on page 18. They're kind of right in the middle of page 16. Your first one is compensated absences, and that's the liability that you have accrued to date for all of the vacation and sick time owed to employees. Your net pension liability of $9.3 million dollars that's your new liability associated with the implementation of GASB 68. And then net obligation for post-employment benefits of 6.6 .6 million, which is your GASB 45 obligation for providing future health insurance benefits for your staff and retirees. You won't find those three liabilities on page 18 because you're not required to account for long-term obligations on the governmental funds balance sheet. It is important to note that with the addition of GASB 68, that net pension liability, your fund balance, your unrestricted fund balance as of June 30, 2015 has gone into deficit. Your, your unrestricted fund balance has gone into deficit as of June 30, 2015. The, um, 
the net pension liability was calculated by CalPERS and, and delivered to the library. And an initial liability or adjustment had to be recorded because that liability has really kind of been there all along. But it was finally required to be measured and recorded in this set of financial statements per GASB 68. So if you flip to page 17, you'll see the third line from the bottom is an adjustment to your fund balance related to restating the opening balance and recognizing that pension liability of $11,696,000. So to be clear, the, the, pension, the, the pension obligation is something that existed previously. You're seeing it slide into this set of financial statements for the very first time and it's causing your fund balance to go negative, um, but it's something that existed previously. It's just happening to be recognized in this, in this one year, okay? Um, if you were to, on page 17, scroll up just a bit higher, even though your fund balance went negative in 2015 as a result of recording that liability, you actually had an addition to fund balance of approximately $1,049,000 the increase in net position just about two lines up from there on page 17. So the GASB 68, I don't want to spend too much time boring the commission with it if it's repetitive, but does everybody understand what that liability is and why we're recording it and why you're required to recognize it? Yes? Do you mean to spend any time on that or any questions about it? It uh, feels reminiscent of... Gatsby 45? Right. So, I mean, 68 is really... 68, I guess you have... It's being really driven by how PERS is managing the assets for you. PERS sets your contribution rate for retiree monetary benefits. PERS invests it, PERS issues you an actuarial report every two years now to let you know whether you're overfunded or underfunded in that plan. As a commission, I think your deciding factors are do we stay with PERS or do we do something else because unless you're, unless you're going to manage the plan assets, you don't have a lot of control over it. PERS is setting your contribution rate, PERS is investing it. I mean, you're, you're sort of stuck with what that liability is unless you're going to dive into another plan outside of PERS. Um, the other one, Gatsby 45, I think we've discussed quite extensively is your health care benefit obligation, which you probably have a little more control over just because, um, you know, as you negotiate back and forth with the union, you're setting future policy around that. And to some degree, it's like uh, Gatsby 45 and the OPEB. It alerts us. I mean, it's like a flashing light that says, oh, you've got this liability. You might want to think about right. how you're going to handle it. Over Which is, time. I think, the next conversation I want to have. And some of this stuff is really not related to findings in the audit. I'm just trying to help you understand it at the end of the day. Um, I mean, we really, if, once we get to the back, you'll see that there are fewer audit findings that we've had in previous years, and some of the old ones are cleared up as well. But because your financial statements are getting hit with such a large liability recognizing GASB 68, I want to make sure that I'm helping you guys understand it and that you really explain it when I leave here. Are uh, all other um, public entities that do CalPERS getting the, being in the same place, basically? Well, I mean, for the most part, yeah, CalPERS is underfunded in terms, I mean, you know, it's a pool of assets and everyone's sharing in the appreciation or depreciation of them, yes. Okay. Um, the th the piece that I think is important to look at in terms of fund balance and how the commission makes decisions about how you fund these liabilities is when you look at the difference between page 16 and 18 and specifically look at the general fund, the general fund has an unassigned fund balance of approximately 4.8 million, excuse me, at the end of June. That very first column on the left hand side, if you follow it down, You'll get to your fund balance section, which has a couple of committed balances for capital improvement and stabilization. And then it's got an unassigned balance of $4.8 That unassigned balance 
doesn't reflect either of these two liabilities because you're not required to recognize long-term liabilities in these governmental fund statements. And so I think as a commission, you've got to look at, okay, well, long-term, we've got hypothetically almost, what, $16 million between GASB 45 and GASB 68 to fund over the amortization period, which for both of these, the amortization period, I believe, ranges between 25 and 30 years. And so I think you have to look at how much of your long-term liability do you begin to fund? It's going, I mean, it's going to hit you at some point, right, as people retire and earn benefits and you have to hire more. But you, you're not required to fund it all and fund that long-term liability immediately or this year. But it isn't going to go away. It's eventually going to start to eat in to that $4.8 million because you're going to have to use those current resources to begin funding it at some point. Is that a little clearer for everybody? I mean, I know it's a big liability to have slide onto the statements, but it's not intended to be funded all currently. I mean, it is a long-term liability, but just like paying down your house, you've got to pay it down at some point. So, well, that's, a, that's something we decide how much we're going to invest in, in the budget? Is that... Well, I mean, there's a number of ways... The, the GASB 68 one is a bit, tr it's a bit tougher for your, the commission to control because you, you're not investing the assets. You're, I mean, you're working with PERS to create this investment pool for it. Um, granted, you could, I guess, change it by changing the age at which you could earn retirement benefits and how much you could earn. Um, but you have less control over that one than you do the healthcare one. The healthcare one has, I guess, a lot more different angles to manage it from in terms of what your promises are, what plans you offer, what you benchmark to, um, what the contribution rates are for employees. That one's a little, I think you have a little more leverage to manage the long-term cost of that one than you do GASB 68. But yes, I mean, what you put into it each year changes, as, I mean, that'll change the liability as well. Follow-up um, follow question to that. Um, so. Is there, from an auditor's perspective, um, we're, we're going to continue to fall behind on the OPEB, what we owe on the OPEB. We're not keeping up with that. I mean, you're getting close. So on the on the OPEB, you actually are. Um, so maybe you can tell me which page this is, and it's page 29 of my document. Page 29 in your document is. 36. <clears throat> 36, right. Yeah. Okay, so 30, page 36 shows you the reconciliation of how your OPEB liability changed from year to year in this statement. And the third line, actually, third line up from the bottom, your liability only increased by 218,000 last year, which is down dramatically from years prior when it was seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. Um, and that's because you funded against the liability last year. Right. Um, and it was also a year where you didn't have an updated study either. So every, every two years you're required to update your OPEB study unless you have a material change. A material change would be um, new union negotiations that result in new contracts and benefit levels, benchmarking to a new health care plan, anything that would cause material change to the actuarial study of the long-term obligation. There wasn't a change and you're in, you're in between your two-year period. And I can't recall, Ken, can you, in the new OPEB study, how much the annual, the annual required contribution changed by? You have it, oh. The, the arc in this one is a million two. back to that page, the very first number on the top there. Which page again? Uh, page, I think it was 36, 36. in your document. 36 in my document. 
required contribution? The annual required contribution is the number that every two years as part of the actuarial study gets updated. And so you're in between your two-year study on this particular statement. That, I'm trying to find my page again. That figure of a million two oh five in the next actuarial study, which just got completed, which will be used for next year's financial statements, that annual required contribution is jumping to a million three twenty. And the annual required contribution jumps based on a number of factors. It's based on increased health rates, it's based on aging staff, um, it's based on inflationary factors, interest earning factors. Um, and if you haven't, the, the OPEB study is actually very short in nature. You might want to have management included as part of your commission packet sometime. It's, I mean, I don't think it's more than 20 pages. It's, it's shorter than this for sure. <laughs> Um, but it would help you understand the factors that go into calculating that annual required contribution. Um, but to answer your question, it, didn't, it does go up each year if you're not fully funding it. But the fact that you funded so much into it last year, your liability really did not increase by much, comparatively speaking, to prior years. I'll have to ask Ken about that, because when we talked about this in the Finance Committee, I, my understanding was that it was to fully fund it, we'd need to put in $1.2 million, and we're only putting in 600000 You So that, that the fully funded piece, and we'll use this $1.2 million, because that's the number you've been talking about based on your current study. That is the number you have to put in. But remember that you already have retirees. That $1.2 million number includes the cost of current retirees and the anticipated cost of future retirees. So even if you stopped funding OPEB completely, you still put in almost 500000 a year just for the current cost of your retirees, right? So that brings it down to seven, 800000 right there that you need to fund additionally. So if you're funding the additional six hundred on top of what you currently pay, you're almost closing the entire gap on that annual required contribution. Hmm. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I understand the pay as you go. So the 1.2 million include buried in there is what the and what the cost is of pay as you go. Okay, the 1.2 includes pay. As you includes go. pay as you go. Yes. So annually, your pay as you go amount is right around 500 thousand. And so your shortfall is the delta between that and the 1.2. Yes. So last year we put in 600,000. Last year, this year, what was the number for this year? Five. You put in five last year, but I, what's in the budget? Six last year, five this year. Okay. So we are falling behind a little bit. Yeah, that's what I thought. No. We put in Just so I am clear, because uh -huh. I've been OPEPing for a while. Uh, basically, the reason we've set up the trust fund is so that when we hit the spot where we can't meet the pay as you go, when we don't, when it's over what we can budget in our operating budget, Correct. we have this savings account that we can start to pull into to be able to meet that obligation, right? The well, if you if you're funding at the six to seven hundred thousand dollar level above pay as you go, and you were to continue to be able to maintain that, the only shortfall you should really end up having is the first five years you did nothing with it. Mm. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the the. Annual required contribution will hopefully not increase so dramatically that you can't keep up with that, right? That your revenue stream and your cash flow allows you to maintain that arc. Otherwise, you probably need to consider making adjustments to what you're funding. Otherwise, it's not attainable at the end. Right, the problem. The, the problem was if we had done nothing, that in 10 years we'd owe 
like 10 million. Right, because of all the interest adjustments against right. it, you would owe, exactly. Yep. And you can, I mean, I guess you can somewhat see that with this new GASB 68 that you had to put on the financial statements this year, that liability. I mean, that's been around for a long time too, underfunded, overfunded, not really clear where it's at because PERS manages it. And so now you've got the, sort of a similar thing happening this year where it's making you go deficit because you're picking it all up in one year, even though it's been around for 50 years. <clears throat> Um, if, if anyone's interested, on page 18 in your document, as we were talking about these differences between the two balance sheets, page 18 at the bottom details out a reconciliation for you of the items. What page are you on? It's this one here. bottom of that document is what will help you reconcile the two different balance sheets. If you look at the very bottom there, there's some parenthetical or some paragraphs that include detail about figures between the two balance sheets. And so you'll note that your long-term liabilities are not included. Capital assets are not included in this one. Um, this balance sheet here, where your fund balance is much larger, deals specifically with just managing current resources, not paying for anything long term, okay? Which I mean in that regard you're very healthy, right? You've got you know, 11 million dollars of fund balance if you weren't to consider obligations for these looming liabilities of your, of your current staff. Does that make sense to everybody? And that's a bad, I mean, I shouldn't use looming liabilities, but there's a, you know, there's an, uh, there's an obligation cost, there's a promise that's been made, and it will eventually start to eat in to those current resources if we don't pay attention to it. Um, the other piece I wanted to bring attention to was just the back of the statements. I know in a, couple of years past, we've had a number of audit findings and management letter comments, um, and pretty much all of those have been resolved um, with the exception of the fixed asset inventory, and I know that one's kind of, it's been on there for a couple of years, but it hasn't been a priority, and um, it's one that we've given some time, I think the commission's given some time to be done, and so that one's still left to be worked on, but everything else has come off of there. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Positive What's that? Positive. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ken. I, I found my question, and I think you just referred to it. That's why I'm bringing it up right now. Okay. Page 42 of the packet, 35 of you, the last sentence says, we, didn't, did, we did identify certain deficiencies in internal control described in the accompanying schedule of findings and responses that we consider to be significant deficiencies. What yeah. are, is that referring to the capital? That's referring, yes. Yeah. So a significant deficiency is actually, it's the more minor of the findings than a material weakness. Okay. So it's the lowest level of finding you could have. And it's related to the yes. capital? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and, and I had a question on your page 25 under concentration of credit risk, uh -huh. where it says at various times during the year the library had on deposit with financial institutions amounts in excess of the 250,000 federally insured deposit limit. And so how does that happen? Um, it, I mean, it's measured on any given day. And so I'm sorry, what? It's measured on any, the, ca the county custodies. Thanks the majority of your cash, right. and then you've got payroll accounts as well. So at any given point in time, 
the balance can exceed 250, even though it might deplete down the next day or the day okay. after, and it's a required disclosure. Okay. So it's not a big issue? I would, no, we don't need, I mean, ordinarily um, for especially private industry clients, you would see that as a management letter type comment because there's an expectation that you would diversify your cash more and mitigate that FDIC risk. Yours is so short term that it's not, it doesn't rise to a level of a finding. Okay. <clears throat> and then there are some losses talked about um, in investments. Yeah, those are, um, that's actually similar to the GASB 68 disclosure where your, you know, your investments ebb and flow and you don't necessarily realize all of your um, market earnings or losses. So you've got quite a bit of cash pooled with the county of Sonoma, mm -hmm. and annually you're earning interest on that cash, but you also have unrealized gains and losses in that investment pool. And the way the county does it is they take the entire investment pool and they look at what the unrealized gains and losses are, and they allocate those out to all the agencies and spread the risk based on the amount of your, your, your ratio percentage. of the investment in the pool. Yeah. Um, and that disclosure has been in there for a number of years. A follow-up on that, though, it was kind, it's kind of a really shocking number. This was on uh, Commission Packet 12, year page 5, which I, is really part of the management report, something I wanted to ask about, but the investment earnings went from 197000 almost 200000 down to 6000 if I'm reading this correctly. This okay. is under the Statement of Change in Net Position. What page is you that? know, if I remember correctly, and I can go back and look, I think you had quite a bit of unrealized gain. I want to say 100 and f I have to go back and look. I want to say you had almost 140,000 of unrealized gain in the prior year, though, that would have accounted for the portion of the 190. So it was abnormally high then the year. Well, it also wasn't realized either. <clears throat> Right, just like if your stock goes up from 50 to 100 bucks a share, but you don't sell it, right. it's an unrealized, it's a gain on paper only. So this isn't a surprising, 197 down to 6 that um, in terms of investment what was? I, Ken, do you recall what the unrealized it, loss it, was? It, it's, it's on uh, his page 5, commission packet, page 12 of 76. So what line are you I don't on? recall the whole amount for last year, but it was large. And so what happens on June 30th, they recognize that large unrealized gain, and then on July 1st, they flip it around, yeah. and it's a loss for the current year. If you look at page 24 of my document, you'll see that the there was um, an unrealized loss in the Treasury pool allocated to <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Well, as bad as that is, it's not as bad as it looks on page five. Well, but remember that if you didn't have that unrealized loss, then your investment earnings would have been almost fifty-eight thousand dollars. That on that's a fifty-eight, fifty-two, fifty-three thousand dollar unrealized loss in the pool that drives your investment earnings down for the year. But the investment earnings went from almost 200000 down to six. Because you had an unrealized gain in the previous year that's included in that 190. I know. <laughs> I don't get it. Ken, in your... Um, in your reports on cash? Are you, do you detail out the unrealized gains and losses or do you just reconcile to it? Yes. Okay. Got to. God. Is, am I leaving anybody unclear on the whole unrealized gain and loss piece when it comes to investment earnings? I guess the bottom line question is, is it something that we need to be 
concerned about, or is it part of the normal operation? I mean, it's normal for your, if you were to go back and look at the historical trends of the county treasury pool, it ebbs and flows every single year. And so it's normal for you to have to adjust your investment earnings annually up and down for the unrealized gains and losses. Um, the only way for you to have more control over it would be for you to custody and manage your own investments. And there are other places that money could be pooled. Yes. Uh, for Although, funds. you know, I'd have to, do you recall what's in the JPA about your ability to custody and manage your own cash? Off the top of my head, no, but I won't, I've talked to Ken about that. You know, I've asked him if it makes sense for us at some point to think about managing our own money versus it, you know, sitting with the county. Yeah. I will tell you if you, and we don't have to talk about this too long, if you decide to do that, it's going to be a bit of work because you're going to have to have your own investment policy Right now, everything that's in there about the county treasury pool and the policy is dictated by the county, and it does relieve you of a bit of a workload in that regard, um, and some of the fiduciary responsibility as well. Yeah, and I think we have talked about this in the past mm -hmm. from, and decided not to do that, but um, it's always something to look at. I mean, at. You're, you, know, you have enough assets at this point and enough cash to manage that you could go to an institution and for very little cost, they're going to they're gonna manage your money. They're going to help you write your investment policy. They're going to help get you everything you need. It's just a matter of balancing the workload and time of the commission and staff to do it. But I, I don't think it would be a huge monetary cost for you to do that. To go to somebody else. Exactly. But, whereas to do it ourselves, it probably would oh, be I mean, a I huge wouldn't recommend. I wouldn't recommend doing it yourself. Yeah. Ken? Um, one thing that uh, I've read is if we pull it out of the county treasury, then we lose the ability for that bridge loan um, in, you know, toward the right. end of the calendar right. year to, to get us to the tax revenue receipts. But, um, but I, that's, I, mean, I, Linda? I can't recall when you've even used that bridge loan. I, I don't, I, 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 think, I mean, we've been working with you for. Linda? Okay, I think the silence you're, you're hearing is the response to the unfunded reliability the, the reminder, and I think that's part of some of what's coming down is, oh my. Yeah. Um, did I, I mean, I, did I leave you with any unclear questions about that? Okay. The, on page 30 of our packet, page 23 of yours, uh, the list of permitted investments. I'm sorry, they, what page on mine? Uh, 23. Mm-hmm. Do they stu do, still do collateralized collateralized mortgage obligations? <laughs> I, I mean, this disclosure comes from the county level. Okay. Didn't they see the big short? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> okay, any other? Um, and I mentioned to Ken as well, you know, it might make sense at some point as these actuarial studies, especially for OPEB Renew, to bring in the actuary for one of your commission meetings and have them present so that if you have questions about the interest factors, the inflation factors, the payroll factors, that you know, you're meeting your fiduciary obligation to at least ask and understand what's in there and so that because you're, you're using those figures as part of your budgeting and decision making process. Okay. Thank you. Anything else that you want to alert us to or comment I don't think on? So. Uh, any further questions from commissioners? All right. Uh, well, thank you, Will, and then okay. I'll ask if there's any public comment on the audit presentation. All right. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Will. Thank you. Okay, moving back to the uh, moving to the agenda to commission uh, reports. Um, I think we'll start at this end of the table this time. Um, I would like to report that uh, just at the um, the the uh, all staff. What was that? The library summit. I received a document about thinking about. The way I labeled it was uh, getting uh, getting the Rolodex set up. And so at my last lab meeting, what I did is I essentially gave homework to the uh, lab members to fill out that form of what organizations do you belong to? Uh, and the other question that brought up a lot was 
who do you know in town that knows everybody? And uh, we, we did that. We went just around the table and filled out that form and got the list of uh, people and organizations. And aside from the fact of its, of its uh, uh, applicability to the question of, um, of moving into uh, advocacy throughout the county and, and the our local uh, jurisdictions, one of the members of the lab said, I've been on this uh, lab for 10 years and I've learned more about the members of the lab than I ever knew before. And so I would just recommend if people uh, are trying to think of an activity with their lab that that was quite useful. Um, the other thing that I would mention in my announcements is uh, thanks to Helena during the uh, Speakers Bureau talk, she alerted me to the Forum magazine, Forum radio show, just had a special uh, hour-long talk with a man who has written the history of libraries. Uh, and I wasn't able to hear the entire thing because I listened as a podcast in my car when I got home. Um, but it is really interesting and useful and um, those of us that are Facebook junkies, um, we might want to add that as a, a, a notice or a mention on uh, our Facebook page to share so that that information can move out. Uh, and yesterday was Lumicon. Our Saturday was Lumicon. Okay. How was it? It was busy. I was only there for a short time, but it was, you know, it's grown in major size. It's uh, the Petaluma, um, the Petaluma uh, Community Center was filled to capacity. The uh, assembly room was uh, filled with uh, people, uh, cartoonists and artists. The stage had a craft center for kids to do things. They had a parade of costumes. And then they, our friends had a bookstore selling comics and graphic novels. There were uh, people all around. I think there was even a lightsaber thing going on outside. And then every one of the rooms was uh, speakers and programs. It was, it was an astounding thing. And it's grown. And they've already reserved it for uh, Lumicon 3. Great. And our friends organization paid for the rent of the building, so this year we were able to have it with no cost of admission. Wow. So it was really quite impressive, and it didn't happen accidentally. People planned it and worked on it and made it happen. So. I, I had that on my calendar to attend. Sadly, I was sick on Saturday and couldn't attend, so it's good to hear that it was a fabulous event. And the book that Tim d just mentioned um, sounds like a really great book with um, lots of information about uh, trends in the library and, um, and comments people have made over the years and how libraries have adjusted to what the community needs. And that's why they stay so relevant today. Um, and the library has a copy. <laughs> I have it on hold. <laughs> Um, my uh, library advisory board meets this Wednesday, so I don't have a report to make. The, uh, it's the Guerneville Lab met on uh, January 13th, and uh, one of the big topics of discussion was uh, Rebecca's Lab Day proposal. Um, there was uh, many comments, and um, I don't think there was any consensus, but they're interested in it, so that's good. Um, let's see, we had, uh, there was an election of officers, and uh, I guess no surprise, uh, the, the officers from last year are the same officers <laughs> that got elected. So. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, too. Um, and then uh, we, I did uh, talk a little bit about um, the survey results. They were interested in that because we, we had the results of the commission meeting uh, just before that. And um, they're very interested in the Speakers Bureau. And I know a number of people from the uh, Guerneville Lab have come for the training. And uh, there was a discussion around what in the community they could go in and talk 
uh, to who they could talk to you know, once they had the Speakers Bureau training. And um, they had some good ideas. And uh, that was about it. Uh, I've been out of town and I know nothing. <laughs> Except what time the whales go by. Right. <laughs> I did not attend the last meeting, but in reading the minutes and in other discussions, there has been a, a real link between the Luther Burbank Latino Family Group visit to the Central Library. Uh, also, uh, there is a lab member who is encouraging uh, bilingual KBBF uh, programming and announcements. and. Um, and I do know that the symphony came to Roseland, as well as other programs that are going on. The next meeting that I will attend will be in March, mid-March. We haven't had a lab meeting in Rennert Park. Um, I, I just had a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, on Wednesday, the first Wednesday of every month is uh, noon times at the Rennert Park Chamber of Commerce. And I went last month, and I'm going to keep going every month. The Friends of the Library are actually the members, but I go and represent the Friends and also say I'm a library commissioner. So I'm going to maintain a presence there. Right after that meeting, I'm going down to our uh, branch and meeting Wendy Helberman and showing the new chair of the, or what's her position, president of the foundation, or executive director of the foundation, I guess. Anyway, I'm going to meet her and show her around Runner Park Branch. And immediately after that, we have our opening for our friend's book sale. And what's different about it this year, where some of the other friends have done this before, but we're going to have a, an opening on Wednesday night that's going to be friends only. So we're trying to add a special goodie. If you're a friend, you get something special. And so um, the people who aren't on our list get to join the friends by paying $5. And um, we're going to try to make it have a special, you know, special zing to being a, a friend of the library. So I bought little, uh, made up little membership cards, and so we're, you know, we're set to go. So that's going to be exciting on Wednesday. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, Phil is gone, and so the library sometimes in Cloverdale feels like it's kind of limping along. Um, with substitutes or trying to get substitutes in there, but they're doing okay. Uh, there is a lab meeting on the third Tuesday of this month, um, so I have nothing to report there. I did go to the Speaker Bureau training, and I found it interesting. I'm still trying to align it with some of the things I think my JPA uh, pointing group would want to hear, but I'm working that out slowly. And I went to the Sustainable Circles monthly meeting, and I think all of you may remember that that's a group of eight entities, profits, nonprofits, and governmental agencies meeting to create a five-year um, sustainability action plan. Um, and it was at Sonoma Raceway, which was really fun. Um, they offered hot rides to people. I didn't take it because of my shoulder, but people came back and they were all glowing and kind of excited because the, they got to go around the track <laughs> and, you know, skidding and doing all that kind of stuff. So it was fun. It was fun to watch them go by, too. Um, anyway, um, they talked about three things that I think were important. Number one was team building and engaging everybody in the organization in thinking in a sustainable line and moving in that direction and getting the right people on your core team and then finding ways to engage those who are not on the core team and get their ideas and input. And I want to extend an invitation to anybody on the commission, they have any ideas um, that might, um, they feel would be a good, sustainable, uh, move on our part, please let me know and I'll get it into our action plan and we'll see how it fits. And I would be more than happy to discuss it with anybody. I know Ken and Brett the same way. Um, then the second thing they talked about was the fact that energy comes first. Energy comes before solar. You make all the do all the good things to your heating and air conditioning, 
to your windows, to uh, whatever, to get the cost down, to get the energy savings there. And immediately you'll start to see a savings on the money side. But then if you decide to do something like put solar on, you're not going to have to put such a large system on, which means the system will cost less. And it will start saving you money on top of that. Now, I know some of the libraries would like to have a solar system. And for some of the libraries, it's totally inappropriate. I know in Cloverdale, there's so many trees around it that any system they'd put on would be an utter waste because the sun would never hit the roof to have it work. So that would be a waste of money. But doing some other things to save energy in Cloverdale would be a great idea. So that was the um, next thing that they talked about. And then they talked, there were two speakers that day. One sp spoke about energy first, and the second one spoke, spoke about HVAC. And I have been involved with an energy business for several years, not so much now, but for many years. And so I'd go to all these PG&E trainings and HVAC and stuff. So it was fun to go and listen, because I knew some of what they were talking about, but then it also hit me how fast the energy industry is changing and growing and learning new things, and how I kind of have to really put a little effort into keeping up with it so I understand what they're talking about. I know one of the things that was kind of fun to hear, and I, I knew it, but I hadn't heard it said this way, is when you go to cool a building, you're not creating cool air. What you're doing is removing the heat from the air so it feels like it's cooler. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it was kind of fun. Anyway, so that was pretty much what I've done this last month or so, I think. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, I don't have much to add to Commissioner McKenzie's report. Um, there has been no lab meeting since our last commission meeting. Uh, the next lab meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, February 16th at 4 o'clock. Thank you. Uh, all right, we'll move on to the commissioner committee reports. Uh, we have a report from the director evaluation committee, Elena, today. Um, I am giving the report because the chair, Hillary Smith, was not able to make the meeting. So uh, 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 Commissioner Gill, May, and I were at the meeting. We met at 4 o'clock. Um, we discussed we need to have one more um, <clears throat> closed session meeting with the entire commission before the final evaluation. And so uh, we, we would like to have it at the uh, April 4th meeting. March is too soon. We, we have too much of the rest of the year left um, to have input, complete input from the commissioners. So we settled on April 4th, which would give Director um, Lear the opportunity to put together a report of his activities and accomplishments um, and challenges to the commissioners. I believe he said he would turn that in April 1st so that we would have time to um, read it and, and provide feedback overall on April 4th. So if there are no objections to that, we would like to, we'll work with uh, staff to schedule that on that day and whether it's during this middle of the uh, budget workshop or whether it's at the end, we'll let you know later. Um, and that will be the opportunity for commissioners to give their final input before the end evaluation. So we'll, we'll give you more direction on, on that. And so we took no other action and, um, and closed at 5.30. Finance, Barbara? Yes, the uh, Finance Committee met on Monday, January 25th in the Central Library Conference Room. The meeting date was changed to the fourth Monday of the month uh, in January because of the holiday and the third Monday of the month, and this is going to be true again in February, so our February meeting will also be on the fourth Monday. In attendance were Commissioners McKenzie, Whistler, Foxen, and CFO Neiman. Commissioner Neff also set in on the meeting. Director Lear was in Sacramento at a NorthNet meeting, and Commissioner Grill was absent. No members of the public were there. 
We received the monthly financials and the audit report at the meeting, so we did not go deeply into either one or either of the, those items. The monthly financial showed that everything was on track and the audit report, uh, we needed some time to study it, obviously, that we had the report tonight. Director Neiman alerted us to the big impact of Gatsby reporting and uh, I, of course, I wrote this before I knew how this was going to play out tonight, but our, our auditor was ill and unable to attend, although he was reachable by phone. We ended up not calling him. Um, so anyway, we've got those reports tonight. Uh, we got our auditor report tonight, and Director Neiman will undoubtedly talk about the financials later on. We spent a good uh, amount of time on the issue of the lab budgets, which have been $500 per year for, uh, per lab for a couple of years. Uh, the discussion was primarily about whether this money was being used, and if so, how, and whether it was adequate. We received two email reports. Um, Rebecca had sent out a request to all the labs uh, for a report. We only got two back. Um, one of them was from Sebastopol and one of them was from Guerneville. And I also then reported on the Runner Park Katati lab and Commissioner Neff reported on Windsor lab. In general, the labs have used, uh, that have used any of the money, apparently only three of the labs, have been using it for outreach. Sebastopol and Robert Perkatati have been using it for outreach at the local farmers market specifically. Commissioner Neff indicated that Windsor was confused about the responsibilities of the lab and although they were aware of their $500 budget, they had not used any of the money. Guerneville had tried to set up an outreach forum and was going to spend about $70 on refreshments, but no one showed up, including apparently the members of the committee. Then we had a spirited discussion about labs, and we decided to request that the subject of labs be placed on the commission retreat agenda, which I have done earlier. It's clear that we all want dedicated library levers to be involved and be supportive of the library. The question is, how do we develop a structure to do this? It was also noted that although we have a place on our commission agenda for labs and friends to report and communicate with us, this, this spot is rarely filled, so it was great tonight to have you know, Mike Keeley from Windsor. It was also mentioned that many of the members of the labs are also members of the friends groups, and so there's so much overlap that at least one library holds these two meetings back to back. This topic needs to discussion at our retreat, as we know. And then I have a happy thing to report. Um, in the past, I had asked for a report on uh, how what energy savings we would have achieve because of the different cities have switched over to clean uh, Sonoma Clean Power, and Ken was able to get this information for us. We the library system saved approximately $38,000 due to the Sonoma Clean Power, and that was from mid-2014 through the end of 2015. So that's a significant thing. It didn't require anything on our part. It's just by switching to Sonoma Clean Power, we saved $38,000, so it's pretty significant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Public Relations Committee. Okay. Well, first, we discussed a directive by the chair last time concerning the in memory or in honor of a person and we find, we find a recommendation and we'll be addressing it later in this meeting. We discussed the commissioner's presentation to the JPAs and using the, rec the presentation that was presented at the speaker bureaus. I hadn't been at the speaker bureau training yet so I couldn't really comment. Well, one person thought it was very, very good and wanted to move forward using it as a base and he wanted to do that immediately. This discussion was revived at another committee meeting in relation to our needs in the search of funding streams and again I was at a disadvantage as I still had not attended the Speaker Bureau's training. But what surprised me was exactly the opposite opinion of it came out. So um, at the meeting today we began talking about this kind of two view of, of um, the presentation and I'm going to talk with Bonnie Jean, our consultant, and get some feedback from her as to which might be better or which way would be best to go because they are, we are, you know, looking to her for her expertise. And we're also going to see if in order to get this to work a little more smoothly, if she might be able to join the Public Relations Committee for the, at least for the first 15 or 20 minutes so we can resolve some of these issues or talk about any that might come up in the future as we go through this. So mostly it was resolving some of these kinds of issues between the two different groups so we're working smoothly. 
Um, we also discussed the roles of labs and the commissioner's relationships to his or her lab. Um, but as uh, Barbara said, we need to discuss it further and possibly the treat or we thought an ad hoc committee. So now that I'm on the committee for doing the retreat, it may be there. <laughs> okay, and that's it. Okay. Uh, I, I wonder if the chair of the Revenue <laughs> Enhancement Committee could give a report. So we're back to me again. <laughs> um, it's the responsibility of the Revenue Enhancement Committee to look at revenue streams and to see if we can locate some that will help supplement what we've got going now. As you probably know, or, and as I said last time, our revenue stream is primar primarily based on property taxes. Sonoma County simply acts as a collection agent and a distributing agent. They, in and of themselves, do not give us any money. But they are bound by the process and limitations set in the mid-70s via Proposition 13 and the state legislature uh, to give us 22 and a half cents per $1,000 of assessed value, resulting in 96% of our funding coming from this one single source. And it severely limits us when there's an economic downturn or as we try to deal with increased costs um, as time passes on. Other library systems have extended their funding streams through various means, and additional taxes is one. It's only one of the ways, but this is one of the things they've done. And we need to understand the taxing systems in California and the options we have as we as a committee or as commissioners um, move along so that we can make an informed recommendation and decision. With the non-negotiable aspects of property taxes, we are left with considering a general tax, an ad valorem tax, or a specialized tax. So one of the things we've been discussing in the last couple of meetings are these different kinds of taxes and how they fit and what works for, might work for us and what might not work for us as we move along and get closer to having to make a decision as to how we're going to deal with this revenue stream. And as I say, this is only one option that we have. General tax is a simple majority tax using, usually levied by counties or cities for their general fund. It is not a specific tax. We are neither a city or a county. We are a special district, which is really important in this process. As such, it makes us ineligible to do a general tax. Also, any tax measure we might do goes to a special purpose because we are a special district, so it's a special purpose. So general tax is out for us. Ad valorem, it's usually associated with schools and things like that. It requires a 55% vote to approve it, but it can only be used for facilities not operations. And again, special districts do not qualify to levy this tax. Okay, so this leaves specialized taxes like utility taxes, business tax, a bed tax, sales tax, parcel tax. These are examples of specialized taxes. For obvious reasons, utility, business, and bed taxes aren't applicable, which leaves us with sales and parcel. As you know, we tried the, with Measure M to get a one cent, one eighth cent sales tax on the ballot in 214, and it requires a two thirds vote to be successful. We got 63 plus maybe, I think it was. In some cities, there's a sales tax cap, but I don't, th I mean, there is a sales tax cap, 10%. I don't think, although some of the cities in, in, that we're dealing with are close to the cap, I don't think any of them have reached it yet. So there's still a little maneuvering room there. Um, and major disadvantage, number one is the cap, and secondly, people don't like to see their taxes go up, the sales taxes. Pros for this tax is it is equitable. Everybody pays a portion that they can afford based on their purchases. Is also taxes visitors to the area and they end up supporting our libraries inadvertently, which is kind of fun. The parcel tax is another tax. This, uh, this tax is unique to California because of what we did with our property taxes 
different entities needed a way to compensate for the monies they lost, so they decided, okay, well, we'll create a parcel tax. And it's usually a flat tax, which is an average of $68 throughout the state, and it's just applied to any parcel of land, which is great, except that equity comes into issue because it's passed on to the renters, so the owner of the property doesn't pay the tax. The renter pays a tax, who's more than likely is in a position who really can't afford to buy a house in the first place. Um, another one is, is a lot of people have, um, especially in this county where we're rural, a lot of empty space with nothing on it. It's not, may not be a money-making adventure. So they're paying tax on a land that's not giving them anything in return, even a living space. So, you know, that becomes kind of questionable in some, some instances, especially here, like I said, in a rural county. Um, those uh, using the library may or may not be paying a tax because they may or may not be in the situation where they would be assessed one. And if they come to the county, they're not assessing, they're not enhancing our system in any way. Okay, so. What I'm saying is taxes are complicated, <laughs> to put it mildly. There are a lot of good papers out there about the different taxes, and if anybody wants to contact me, don't hesitate. I'll send you the links, and you can sit down and have a joyous evening of reading <laughs> wonderful tax information. <sighs> it is fun, actually. I kind of enjoyed it. Also, and we also, at the same meetings, we began developing, uh, delving into grant possibilities. And apparently, from what I understand, there really has not been an assigned grant writer who researches grants, who finds these grants, and then writes them up. And there hasn't been one for quite a while now. So it's not that the commission needs to be finding these grants or writing the grants, but we need to know and understand the process so we can encourage and support what the administration is doing um, as they establish the necessary infrastructure. And, you know, I've run across, across a couple of grants, one of them is a sustainable grant that's quite a bit of money for a solar system that might be possible to put on one of the libraries, but I didn't even know what to do with it. So this is some of the stuff that we need to learn. Um, finally, the Revenue Enhancement Committee is setting up some meetings with some of the people in the business community in an effort to lay a foundation for building relationships in that particular sector. Um, and we're going to be arranging for a meeting with Wendy Hillebrand, Hill, Hillerman, Hilberman, um, okay, the lady she mentioned earlier. Uh, who's the new director of the Sonoma County Library Foundation and discussing what our relationship is and, and how it works between us. Maybe figuring something out that might work. Anyway, I probably will be repeating myself over the next few months as we sort through some of this. But I know I had some questions about property taxes and maybe we could change that 22 cents because whatever I said last time didn't sink in, and it's nothing we can do. It's stuck there. I mean, it's a done deal at this point in time, so we need to look elsewhere. So, as I say, I may be repeating myself every once in a while, but just bear with me because there are people with still questions out there, still people out there with questions. Anyway, so that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now is the time for public comment on any of the commission report, uh, reports or the committee reports. Are there any public who wishes to co wish to comment? We'll move on to the uh, approval of the minutes. Before we go to approval, were there any changes recommended or things people wanted to correct? I see no hands, so I'm, uh, I will invite a motion. I move second. adoption of the minutes. I'd like a second. 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 All right. And I believe we'll have an abs abstaining. But all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? And uh, Paul, you're abstaining, right? I guess that I am, Tim. Thank you. Because you weren't at the meeting. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, moving on to the uh, correspondence and press coverage. Uh, I imagine most of you saw the article today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we usually get a copy of some other ones, but I didn't. Did anybody get some in the email of other coverage? Because I didn't. Okay, we'll move to the consent calendar. Now, uh, th this is there any item on this agenda that people would like to have removed from the consent calendar? Uh, I guess I, I do. It's the one on adjourning meetings in memory of, because I'm a little confused. I don't think we actually came. It says uh, that we would follow the procedure that was established in the January meeting. I don't think we actually established a okay. procedure, did we? So that item is removed and will be taken into uh, uh, action item Separately, so let me. See. I, I thought it was referred to the uh, committee to come up with and the committee a more concrete. On your table today was their recommendation, but we have not discussed. Right, that. but it wasn't. Right. Yeah. All right. So that item has been removed from the consent calendar. Is everyone else uh, okay with the consent calendar? The items on the consent calendar we have the uh, changes to the bylaws and the. Uh, Authorization for library closure for staff day. I move adoption of the consent calendar with the um, exception of the item pulled. All right. Uh, that being said, I, what I've, I've reread the consent calendar procedure, and we all just have to basically nod our heads and say, okay, if there's nothing that people want off, because we don't actually vote on it, per se. That's what I saw. I agree. That's we just have to agree, and if nobody objects to the, we go on with it. So we'll now move on to the adjourning me meeting in memory and in honor of someone. We have a draft. Uh, if anyone would, we have a few leftover copies. If anyone's interested in this, um, there. Uh, this is a recommendation from the public relations committee. Um, and my proposal would be that since we've just gotten it tonight, it might be best if we wait till the next meeting to uh, vote and discuss. But have nobody's really had a chance to read it yet uh, since we just got it. So we'll push this to the next meeting if that's all right with people. Okay. Did you want to Thumbs up to move it on to the next meeting. Okay. Good. Okay. Discussion items. Let me get the pages here right, folks. Excuse me a minute. All right. Management report. Brett? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Just have a few things I'll share. I want to thank you all for attending the Speakers Bureau training. We got everybody there but Paul. Now we got to get you. There'll be a third one, uh, so we'll get you then. Um, I have tried to continually remind the labs and the friends and the foundation that we'd like to get uh, plenty of their members trained as well, so we'll see what response we get to that, and then we may schedule a third session as well so we can get those folks trained. A um, couple things I'll mention. Uh, we had what I'm calling a visioning session at the Central Library the week before last, um, and that ties into our strategic plan. There's a goal in there that says we'll get you know, clear on the role that the Central Library plays in the community. Um, staff there do some things for the entire county. We've got quite a few staff involved in collection development on the Central staff. Um, we've also got some unique collections at Central, uh, like the government documents collection. Um, but I'd also like to figure out if, you know, if we want Central to really have a a distinct personality or, or something about it that's, you know, actually pretty amazing. You know, I think as you travel and you go into some of the main and central libraries and other cities and towns, um, when you walk through the doors of those buildings, sometimes they, they really grab you and, and kind of fill you with awe and wonder. Um, so I'd like us to consider that for our central library. Do we want it to be one of our branch libraries or we, do we really want it to be 
um, kind of a central jewel in this community. So we'll continue to explore that. The first step was hearing from staff, and then I, I want to figure out uh, how to ask some questions of some citizens and, and probably also you as well. Um, but I'm happy that we've gotten that underway. Um, the facilities master plan, uh, we interviewed four firms and Ken is charged now with making a decision about which firm we're going to go with. I think what, Friday, by Friday, you're supposed to make up your mind and then we'll get cracking on that. That'll help us evaluate our buildings, um, give us a cue for which buildings you know need help first and also uh, try to get a, a standardized lease, lease process in place and also really create a floor plan or, or something that kind of informs us of what do we want any new or remodeled libraries to look like as we start to invest in our buildings. So that's moving along. We're also doing interviews for the facilities manager position that you all approved. Those interviews start this week, uh, so that's chugging along. Um, and lastly, I just you know wanted to remind everybody that Friday is Rebecca's last day, and. It, you get to take the commission day off when you're a short timer, so she's not here tonight. Uh, but if she was, I'd certainly want to thank her for all the help she's provided me since I've been here. She really has been my my right arm, uh, so I'm grateful for for what she's done for me and the organization, and I wish her the best. She's going to San Mateo to be a senior librarian there, uh, so she's going to another very good library system. So that's it for me. Any questions y'all have? Any questions on the um, on the on the written part, either the verbal or the written part of the uh, management report? I have two two questions. Uh, one is I noticed under the Mike Daw um, Mike Daw's report that Mobile Circ um, is well. Anyway, my question is: Is Mobile Circ, which I understand is a program that you can go to other places and issue library cards? Because we talked about going to Rancho Cotati High School at one point in time and getting all the kids, you know, enrolled with library cards there, and we didn't have the mobile cert up and running. So, is that all branches could do something like that in terms of outreach? Any any branch would have the ability to go to a facility somewhere in their town and with a mobile cert issue library cards offsite. Yes, it'll give us that capability. Pardon me? Yes, it'll give us that capability to do that. So we can do that now? Um, I don't know now. Um, Vicki might be better able to talk about any timelines or that, but there's that. And then, you know, there's also some functionality if we chose to use it later. Even pub the public can check out materials themselves with certain apps now on a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So, as far as what all we do with it, um, I imagine Vicki's tracking that. Do you want to speak to that at all, Vicki? Sure. Yeah. I think you're talking about Lucy, right? No, the, the mobile app capability. The yeah. mobile checkout with uh, Well, I was talking about mobile circ, which I thought was the ability to go someplace else in your community and issue a library card. That's what I thought it was. That's right. I mean, what, what Mobile Circ is, it just allows full circulation functionality without having a data connection um, or with the data connection. But yeah, that's one of the things we could do is now check out books in and out live off-site. So, so you're, if I'm interpreting, you're saying there are basically two issues to Mobile Circ. One of them is being able to issue library cards. The other is if you were to go to something like Lumicon and have some library books there, you could check them out at Lumicon at, as, with people with cards. So it's like both aspects of, of CERC. Right? Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Okay. Let's see. Is this on? Yeah. So um, one of the things that we're going to um, make have go live later this month is is the actual mobile app for your iPhone or for your Android phone or smartphone in any case and so then um, that that will allow you to actually self check out your materials using that 
device. Um, it'll also allow you to access electronic resources that we have uh, with the handheld or your iPad or whatever mobile device that you are using. The other thing that um, we're talking about here is also um, the work that's being done by our digital library group, which um, will actually, um, we're moving rapidly toward being able to actually register yourself electronically as a user, and then that identification will allow you to use resources either within the library or from home, for example, research materials, uh, database uh, resources that are available from our website. So it, if you can use the idea of like um, how you can uh, set up an account in Amazon, we'll just use that as an example, then you can set up an account for yourself by hitting our website and then registering. And we're working out some of the details right now. I expect that within a couple, three weeks, we'll have those issues um, worked out so that that um, number that you're assigned when you sign up for a card will actually be the keys to the kingdom, that you'll be able to access many, many things. And we already know that the, um, the system that we have, our online catalog system, will allow us to do that, but we're refining those capabilities so that all of the things that you want to do uh, from the website are, are allowable. So um, the way the system works right now is that it puts a special character in the, uh, in the number that it assigns you. So we're just working out some of the, the details with that. But um, Mike Daw and uh, Ron Osarian are working uh, really closely together with me about that. And I do think within the next couple, three weeks, we'll have that nailed down. So, so there's, there's really two products. One is called Mobile Circ, and that's from the vendor that uh, created our online catalog, Cersei. And what that is is either a staff member or a member of the public. It'll make your iPhone or an iPad or something be able to check out books. So there's that. And then the other thing that's coming along is what's called Boopsy. And that just will really bring all the functionality of our website into an app that you can load on your iPhone or Android device where you can place holds, look at the catalog, look at events, download an ebook, but it'll just give full functionality to a, a mobile device. So two different products that do slightly different things, but I think you were talking about the mobile circ. So the, um, the mobile app, well, well, actually, so the digital branch can actually, eventually, in a couple of weeks, you'll be able, you don't have to go into the library for anything, including getting a library card. Right. 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 And then, but if you want to check out, you know, hard copy books right. or DVDs, you still have to show up. Right. right. But you could place holds and things like that. But are you saying that once we do the mobile app on our phones, that if we're in the library, we pull a book off the shelf, we can check it out on our phone? Yep, that capability is built into the Boopsie app. Yes, ma'am. So how do you do that? I mean, well, um, there's a scanner. You know, there, there's a scanner uh, as part of the app. I have it. If you want to see it after the wow. meeting, I can show it to you, and you can see what it looks like. And you can even, I can even give you the link where you can download it. So we don't want to get caught up in this too much, but okay. um, it can. Yes. Well, it's fascinating, though. I mean, this is a huge leap forward. If the people were going into branches and people pulling out their cell phones and then walk out the door and without going through. Isn't, or you think that's a really big deal? It's worth talking about. Yeah, I think it may be. Go ahead. You want well, to? it is a big deal. I mean, it's not, and, and in one way, it's not really different than walking up to the self-check and checking your items out either. Um, the difference is your library card ID is stored in the app, you know, your your ID number, your unique ID number. But a anyway, um, I think that we're scheduled to roll this out. I think, if I remember correctly, February 9th. Yeah, I just want to be careful, you know, the, the the Boopsie app, which will allow you to 
you know, look up our events and placeholds and all that through your mobile phone. That's going live. The functionality as far as, you know, us turning on the capability of, of going up to the shelf and checking out a book, you know, that's not coming in the next couple of weeks because there'd be, you know, there's some procedures and processes right. around that, security and all that. So that one's one we're excited that's available, but before we implement it, we need to work with our own staff and that to figure out how to do it. Correct. I think I put the cart before the horse, but the capability is in there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question for, I think, probably David. What the heck are zip books? Does it allow me to go through the uh, toll booth on the Golden Gate Bridge easier? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the magic card that you, allows you to do everything. From, you can check out books, go through the bridge. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Zipbooks is a program that was implemented by the State Library for rural counties in California as an alternative to traditional interlibrary loan. So if there was an item that somebody wanted, it wasn't held by your library, it was an older book, not a brand new book, um, you could request it from the library and the mechanics of it were that the library would order it from Amazon, from a used bookseller usually on Amazon. It would be sent directly to the patron at their home, arrive in a couple of days, hence the zip part of zip books. And then when they were done with it, they were asked to bring it to the library for inclusion in the collection or not, depending on what the library felt. And really in terms of price point and so on, it's a pretty neat thing to think about because we spend We've calculated anywhere between 50 and 15 and $25 per book we get through interlibrary loan. Those are just costs, and then we, at the end of the day, we don't own anything. We, it's gone. It's back to the lending institution. These are staff costs, mail costs. Paul, you're looking really upset, but that's what it costs. So um, this would be actually cheaper, and then we'd wind up with an actual book, and the patron would get it uh, in a fraction of the time it now takes to get interlibrary loans. So we have a lot to work out, but it could be great. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. I know, you're a big ILL user, so. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but still, I mean, the cost difference, if, it's, if your administrative costs are, let's just say, 20 bucks to do an I, in a library loan. Mm -hmm. and you, There'd still be some cost administratively to zip books as well. We, you can't discount half. that. Hmm? Maybe, I don't know. We'd have to look at it real carefully. There's one library in the state that we think is doing it without the state grant, and that's Ventura County Library. And I'm trying to be in touch with their director to find out how without that works. Without the state grant? Without the state grant. The state is grant is done. They're not doing yeah. it anymore. They're not giving people money to uh, pilot this program. Uh, they were trying it out with a bunch of rural counties around the state, but now that's run its course. And I believe what they, they say they've done is they've piloted it. They have all the paperwork and documentation on how you do it. Here it is. It's available to all the libraries. Go forth and implement. Nice idea. Okay. It still yeah. strikes me as really shocking that somebody wants a book and we buy it for them. I mean, do yeah. we, we don't approve what, you know, like if somebody requests a book, you would say, well, you know, we may or may not buy that book. But if, is it different than that? It's just... It, in point of fact, we are a patron-driven acquisition model library anyway. So the, the tendency and what I lean towards as collections manager is to get what people want uh -huh. in their library. So you can't always do that. Sometimes we can't afford it. Um, sometimes it is so highly specialized or academic that it doesn't pay to get it. Sometimes people want something that's outdated, in which case interlibrary loan is the perfect alternative. And a zip book, if it's cheaper, and if it doesn't, you know, impinge on our library's operations, it seems like a great way to get the material into the people's hands that they want. So, but again, you would you okay that? Or what if they just, if it was a book and it was a book we didn't have, we'd just buy it for them and send it to them, and then they would have a book. Well, there'd have to be some parameters, you know, limitations on numbers probably per patron that we would accommodate because someone might have a favorite author or subject and they just want everything on that. We're not just going to willy-nilly, without any forethought, purchase everything that everybody wants and send it to their home. So there will be parameters, just like there are with interlibrary loan. We haven't established all that yet at all. So, so this is looking up over the horizon. 
up and over the horizon. Yes, well put. Well, I would, okay. I would actually hope that if we're going to do it, that we do it in the next budget cycle. You know, I, I think David makes sure that we have a collection that meets the needs of most of our, you know, folks in the community. And then when somebody does ask for something that we don't own, you know, anymore, when you go on Amazon and you look it up, used, it's like a dollar ninety nine. So right. to spend a dollar ninety nine on an item that that someone wants, it's actually very cost effective. And then, like you said, you know, we ask that the person donate it to the library, and then we either add it to the collection or we give it to the friends to sell at book sales. So um, I just, you know, the delivery speed, the cost effectiveness, it's just something that, you know, I think is attractive. I had a, a, a question uh, briefly, hopefully, on um, the nonfiction. I wonder what the strategy is going to be. I see that there's going to be a budget cut in purchasing nonfiction books, and just wondered what going to so be. What, um, did oh, I say is? that? <laughs> did I say that in my report? There. Said, uh, under collection development, it says notably a marked marked shift of funds away from nonfiction into efforts to fill the most often used parts of the That collection. happened last year, yeah. We, we did shift quite a bit of funding out of nonfiction purchasing over into funding purchase alerts so we could bring our hold ratio down. You know, it was at eight to one, so every time there were uh, insufficient copies at an eight to one ratio, copies to requests or requests to copies, um, we would buy another one. Now it's six to one, so we put more money into that. We also put more money into um, just general uh, fiction purchasing and uh, also Lucky Day uh, books. So that we're attempting to uh, meet the things that people are actually using. And uh, I just I've started running the second year statistics now, and it looks like there's been an amazing um, result from some of the branches implementing these kind of recommendations. So I know um, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but at, Sebast at um, Sonoma last year, they went from um, a turnover rate Oh, I'm going to get too detailed here, but I can give you all kinds no, of numbers. Okay. I mean, they, they, they eliminated a couple thousand items in their nonfiction collection, and their circulation went up tremendously. Uh -huh. So it's just a, it's the fact that you can see the collection. You can see what's there on the shelf. It's, you know, they have room to put things face out here and there on the shelves. Just that alone, and getting the shaft out of there, people can see the gold or the wheat. I'm mixing my metaphors. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sure. Um, I, I just want to call attention again to, I won't go through the list of all the wonderful things that are happening, which I tend to do, but it feels like we have a vibrant, dedicated library staff working hard to serve the public, and I am continually impressed every time we get these reports. The variety of what's happening, the way people are thinking about making the library a living organism, just really, I want to frame each one. If I had a big refrigerator, I'd put one of these on each month for like the star from the library staff. These are it's just wonderful. I know you had a comment. Uh, well, it was just, I had a question about um, under Kathy DeWeese where it talks about the strategic plan priority 2-C-1. Page 63 of the, of the packet. Right, sorry. Um, and, I, and, and it sounds great, um, but I just had a question about the strategic plan, the wording, because when we looked at this back in October, I thought that we had a question, that the commission had questions how, questioned how, how, it could be um, evaluated whether our activities actually improve grades. And um, I thought that we had asked that that might be changed. To learning instead of To grades. learning. And I just wondered if that, had, if that hadn't happened or if, because it just seems hard to, like, how do you evaluate that we it contributed to that? Yeah, I think the wording has stayed what it is there, so that would be my fault that I didn't make that change, but I believe Kathy's right that the wording remains what she's quoted here. And uh, I would just say that since, since Catherine's here, 
I enjoyed reading about the archives. And are you going to talk about that tonight? Is that what you're going to talk about? Okay. She's been so busy. Okay. Anything else from commissioners about the um, activities, monthly activities? I will also add uh, on the page about the uh, hires and changes the, uh, that Patrick and I interviewed three people on Wednesday, Wednesday for the position for the uh, halftime support for the commission and halftime human uh, resources. And uh, we're in the process of deciding among those three. So that process is moving along. Monthly financial statement. Uh, it starts on page 68 of the packet. Um, as you can see, uh, the big thing for the month of December is we received uh, about $9.5 in tax revenue, uh, the first payment uh, coming through the property taxes. Um, and that's about 57.6% of the budgeted amount for the year. So we'll be getting the rest of it in April and June, I believe. And um, there are a couple big items noted there, um, the commercial insurance and the uh, payment for the license fees for the BOOPSI that you talked about earlier. Okay. And uh, uh, so that was the biggest thing that uh, is worth noting is the tax revenue for the um, month that came in. Um, other than that, there's not much more of note to discuss unless someone has any questions about uh, anything. Do I see any questions down the table? No? Barbara, did you? I just wanted to comment again that it was so wonderful to hear the auditor saying all the old stuff had been cleared up and, you know, commend yes. you for that as Tim already did, but I, it's just really impressive to, I wasn't in the old world with all the problems in the audit, so it's wonderful that you've done such great work and cleared it all up. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Reese? He's, he's blushing. Well, just one note on page 68 uh, where it says tax revenue, the library has not needs to be crossed out. It's not supposed to be there. Excuse we me, what? have received it. It has not received and should say has received. Oh. Did you get that? It, it's just a small nitty correction, but uh-huh. All right. Um, I'm going to just take a quick break here um, to ask if there are any public comments regarding what we've just discussed in the discussion items so far. Okay. Moving on to the uh, item uh, budget discretionary funds document that was requested last year, uh, I mean last meeting, go ahead. Um, I would like to uh, thank Ken for this. Oh, monthly staff report, go ahead. Monthly staff report. Is that that? Oh, I skipped. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Ken. Hello, do I want to go? Good evening, commissioners and um, Director Lear. I think most of you know me as Catherine Reinhardt. I'm the manager of the Sonoma County History and Genealogy Library, which is a special collection that operates under the wing of the Central Branch Library. We're housed in a separate building called the Annex. Um, also, I am, as a designee of the library director, I also oversee the management of the Sonoma County Archives, which will be the subject of my brief presentation here tonight. Um, to put it in terms of our strategic plan, the Sonoma County Archives is an amazing asset to the library that surprisingly not that many people know about. 
So I'm here to provide a little background, which may be repetitive for some, but brand new information to others. Um, again, as some of you may know, the Sonoma County Library was originally designated the official archive for the County of Sonoma in 1965 um, by resolution. That same resolution also uh, named the city, it also named the library as the city of Santa Rosa's archive. Although it's been interesting, uh, my observation is we have, um, we do not have a lot of Santa Rosa governmental documents. Um, I think maybe initially um, things were given to the library and then somehow, I don't know if it was a staff change or whatever, but it, they stopped coming. <laughs> Um, I've added, as one of your, t um, to, to read more on the subject, I've provided you a copy of that resolution from 1965 as a t uh, handout number one. And I think the idea was, um, so this is 1965, plans were in the works to build a new library in downtown Santa Rosa, and this was also about the time that they were getting ready to tear down the courthouse. And so it was thought, with the new Santa Rosa Library, they'll just, we'll have lots of room to store the county's archives. So, um, so they proceeded. And for a number of years, what we know today as the closed stacks served as the, um, the archives for the county. And I remember, um, as a graduate student, actually doing, um, looking at archival material in the archives way back when. Um, then 1979 comes along and a Sonoma County Historical Records Commission was created. That would be um, handout number two, describes what their, um, what their mission is. Uh, like Tony Hoskins before me, I serve on this commission as a designee of the library director. And it was through the efforts of the Sonoma County Historic Records Commission that it was determined that a more adequate location be found for archival materials from the county. We were kind of busting at the seams, kind of like we are today. Um, so moving slowly through government process in 1995, uh, the county offered us a surplus building out at Los Gilicos that is um, approximately 3,866 square feet in size and it's located nine miles east of the central Santa Rosa branch out there by um, oh, Juvenile Hall, um, Regional Parks has a facility, um, Hood, Hood Park or um, Hood House is there. So it's kind of a combination of county offerings going on out there, including a shooting range. Um, but we're, we have a, a, a warehouse there and um, when that move occurred in 1995, the county provided the library with $63,000 to physically move all the items that were at the library itself, as well as scattered about the different county departments, and move them all to the archives, and then catalog them. And the research I've done, I cannot find any time since that the county has provided funds for the maintenance of the archives. Um, yet boxes continue to come in to be cataloged from various um, departments and one of the, the, the reasons for the Historical Records Commission is because we then you know, somebody wants to get rid of their boxes, they want to put them in archives, or they want to put them in records management, we review the, the documentation and make a determination of whether they're archival or not. Um, so we are still accepting materials, and the county is still requesting materials to come out to them. In particular, we get requests primarily from the coroner, the Board of Supervisors, Environmental Health and Community Development Departments. And the coroner in particular, um, as I understand it, they've run out of storage space themselves. And although the Sheriff's Department is working on coming up with a solution, they are basically using the archives as their own sort of lending library. 
And this has put a strain on, um, on staff, primarily the, the, the physical driving back and forth. I um, noted that from February of 2015, library of staff have made over 60 trips to and from the archives to pick up, deliver, and return various county documents. The archives continues to be a treasure trove of materials that documents the history of our county and to a lesser extent Santa Rosa and even Petaluma. I meant to bring, um, it's funny the things that have ended up there. I found a, um, an arrest log for the city of Petaluma from 1911 to 1927 and I'd say 85% of the arrests were for drunkenness and about 80% of the, uh, the accused were named John Doe. Um, this was great interest to the uh, Petaluma t Police Department. Um, just this last week, I had a request for an 1889 coroner's inquest um, that was for a woman who had committed suicide in Healdsburg, who was going to be, not specifically because she had committed suicide, but was going to be featured in a Healdsburg Museum exhibit. And I was able to scan that very old, fragile document for them to put on display. I had another man doing genealogical research and he wanted um, a school register from the 1930s. Again, was able to locate that and bring it on in. But again, I had to go to there, pick it up and bring it back. <clears throat> now we have a lot of supporters in the community for the archives. For instance, we have the Sonoma County chapter of the California Land Surveyors who are working on getting what's what we call the Wallace Collection, which is an immense collection of surveys that were done in the county. Um, uh, Mr. Wallace was both a private uh, surveyor and also worked for the county. This is incredibly valuable information for people doing surveys today. Um, they've been going in and when Tony was here, was trying to make some sense of, of things and created inventory. We also have the Sonoma County Genealogical Society. There's a group of volunteers working on indexing court records. Um, the, the importance of these court records is people are mentioned in these documents that may not show up anywhere else. You know, if somebody was here in the 1850s, that might be the only place they show up. Um, so they're working on this, but this is very tedious because we have to bring each volume, you know, a handful of volumes out at a time for them to work on. The archives are an amazing asset and something that the library and county should be proud of, but accessibility, as in getting all the items inventory, is an issue, as is their physical environment. I was going to do a PowerPoint, but I decided to keep it simple and hope that what I say will inspire you to come out for a tour, either as collectively or individually. I'll, I'd love to have you out there. But I, um, so the, the building has a fire alarm. But unless you're standing in front of the building and the alarm goes off, no one's going to know that it's going off. It's not hooked up to the fire department in any manner. The sprinklers will go off, which of course will then destroy everything inside the archive. So those are things that aren't, aren't best. Um, accessibility for just getting there, um, the, the distance that it takes to drive out there. Um, and also something I would have shown you in a, in, a, in a slide is a lot of the shelving is not exactly ac adequate. We have, we have large ledgers that are actually sitting on shelves that are sagging um, and, not, and, and leaning on their side and, and not the best care for such important documents. This unique collection of materials warrants our attention. Staff and funds are needed. Well, you could probably say that about every library in the, um, every branch in our system. But we have partners in place that you might not, you know, think of. We've got, as I mentioned, the land surveyors, the genealogy society, the Sonoma County Historical Society is very interested in having those items be accessible and, and are willing to volunteer. But as you know, volunteers are great, but you need to have someone to manage them. And um, so we're working on that. Um, so I think with that, if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer. But the main thing I wanted to, um, to say is I welcome you to come visit and see with your own eyes. It's really nice. It's on Pythian Road. You'd have a picnic at St. Francis Winery there on, on your way out. Um, also, I neglected to mention 
uh, your third handout, which actually is a great summary. This is when the, the physical building, the archives, was established and um, gives a little synopsis here, the background on um, the creation of the county library being the county archive and so forth. So I thank you for your time. Yes. Well, I appreciate it. And giving the time, did I hear you say that when the coroner wants something, you guys have to deliver it? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I would say that yeah, I don't want to get into the weeds, but uh, yeah. And it's not just the coroner. Any department who wants one of their boxes, uh -huh. call us up, give us this box number, then I determine where it's located, and then one of our um, delivery staff will then take it from there. And they Thank deliver it to the department? They deliver it to the department, and then the department will call me when it's ready to be picked up. Holy mackerel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Huh. I, I visited with Tony right before he left, and he was telling me about this. And the first time I'd ever heard of the archives, but it was really shocking that it's this prick Pickman delivery. Nobody thinks twice about it. I mean, they just call us, and and it's just something I think it just had just fallen into. This was just the routine. This is what everybody does. And you make it this good point. You haven't found any compensation for this whatsoever. Back in the old days when we were under the library's budget and all that kind of stuff. You could see how it would happen. You can see how this could get missed in negotiating the JPA. But it has to have attention. This is crazy. I mean, why are we doing this? It's just, I can but see we can be clearly, responsible, but not. Clearly it needs to be looked at. Yeah, and, and, and soon. So maybe the fine. <laughs> maybe okay. the fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Great report. You have. Uh, I'll, I will take you up on that. All right. Yes, absolutely. It sounds fabulous. Yeah. I'd love to have a tour. Yeah. I'd love to take you up there. Bring your sweaters. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Catherine. Don't know what to do with all that information, but... It's a lot. Thank you. Um, moving on to the... Now back to the uh, discretionary funds. Hi, uh, this is on page 73 and 74 of your commission packet. And uh, this was in response to a discussion at the, at the last commission meeting about uh, discretionary funds, how much is actually discretionary in uh, our budget. And uh, on page uh, 74 is my attempt at uh, getting to this number. Um, you, one could argue that all of our budget is discretionary, that we can uh, say yes or no to anything. Uh, the other extreme would be that um, we're running so lean that none of it's discretionary. Um, I came up with something in the middle, um, and uh, you know, it could be, each of the items could be argued one way or the other, but this was my best shot at it. Um, as you can see, I have the payroll and benefits of 73.3%. Uh, the materials of 10%, and then I came up with, uh, I went down the budget um, line by line and just kind of uh, said, okay, what do we need to keep the doors open and, and things like that. And um, I came up with another 10%. And that left 6.7% uh, um, that uh, I labeled discretionary or $1.2 million. Um, and some of the line items there, um, one could argue, uh, depending on who you talk to, that uh, they could be discretionary or not, one way or the other, like I said, uh, it depends on your opinion as you look down through there. Um, the other thing to, to note, though, also is, uh, as Will talked about later, the fund balance um, is also discretionary as far as the commission goes, and uh, you can... Um, do things like uh, one-time expenses, whether it's the OPEB trust, capital improvements, or other items. So I think that's worth noting on here also. So I don't know if there's any questions or anything you'd like me to get into, but... Uh, I'm confused. Aren't we obligated to the OPEB trust? No. It's, it's taken up every year at budget time. 
uh -huh. um, and the commission decides whether to uh, make an additional deposit into the trust or not each year. We're obligated to make the payments to the people currently retired. Right. But we're not obligated to put money into the trust to cover future expenses. That's, Thank you. That's true. The only thing I'll remind everybody of is you did, um, well, Ken presented what, uh, you developed a plan for contributions to that trust. So that is in place. It, there are at least guidelines for annual contributions. Right. And Ken can reshare that at any time. But we looked at that, what, about six months ago? Uh, we looked at it at uh, the last uh, April during the budget uh, discussion. And it will also look at it again this year, right? Mm -hmm. And my impression about looking at this list, I think I tend to fall more in the category of everything's discretionary uh, as opposed to nothing. But I do know that, for example, you've listed payroll and benefits as uh, non-discretionary. But we do discuss, at the last year's budget, we discussed adding positions. Right. Uh, and we discuss, we negotiate salary, and so to some degree, though there's a there's there's wiggle room in the top part from what I see as, as I read that list. Any other comments, or uh, Paul? Yeah, I have a comment, and this may or may not be germane, but it does touch payroll. And uh, there were some national averages that. I believe you shared with me and possibly Reese about when we looked at an accounting of 100%, like breaking down a budget. Was there a national average of what payroll and benefits were in a library system? And if you don't recall that dialogue or Reese, you don't recall that, then that's okay, I'll let it go. Well, there probably is a national average. One of the things we looked at uh, a few months ago was. Um, uh, eight, eight or ten um, libraries in the state and across the country that are known as good libraries. Mm -hmm. And I think we came up at that point in time that the ideal mix, at least for, uh, you know, salaries and benefits would be approximately 64 or 65 percent. Yeah, that was the number I remember. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Uh, Reese, no. Well, the point of this was that Joanne, Commissioner Sanders, said if we're going to talk about priorities, we need to know what, we, what we're really able to deal with. So I don't know if she hasn't probably seen this, but I don't, this, is, this is to lead us into us setting our priorities for the budget discussion, right? Right. So it's an interesting document. I appreciate you're doing it. And we looked at it at the Finance Committee meeting. But um, it's really the person that it's aimed at isn't here to accept it. Okay. Um, any public comment on this item? Well, I just wanted to point out when you're talking about percentages like payroll and benefits 73.3 percent what does that mean and you're asking what is an ideal national average or uh, an ideal average for California remember you're talking about a percentage of what so the same number of people in an institution with a larger funding stream you know the same number of people might be 65 percent of a larger a library with more revenue and 73% might be the same number of people in a library with fixed revenue. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the, uh, the Budget Commission uh, input. Uh, I, um, we mentioned this at the last meeting and asked commissioners to think about this. Um, uh, what let me check with uh, both Ken and Brett. Um, what kind of, what exact, what are you hoping to hear from us about on this? 
whatever? Or? No, I mean, you know, my, my preference would be very high level things. Um, you know, staffing, collections, um, facilities, IT, um, or if you've gone through the strategic plan, you know, see some of the initiatives that are in there, um, you know, start those sooner rather than later. Um, but that's that's the level that, that I think would be most helpful because, honestly, that's where Ken and I are starting, too, is, you know, do we invest enough in IT, in our facilities, um, in the collection, um, kind of the, the big pieces of the budget, um, you know, certainly rather than we should have more DVDs or more new furniture, um, it, but, you know, give us some pointers as far as what you're thinking at the highest level. That would be my two cents. Okay. Shall we start? Let's start, uh, let's start with Linda, and we'll go down the table and then back. You. I need a clarification. Okay. And that would be, if I said staffing, and specifically if we're looking at Roseland, you don't want to hear that. You just want to hear staffing. I didn't hear all that. Huh? Could it, you repeat that? I didn't hear the yeah. whole thing. So if I said staffing, specifically Roseland, you don't want to hear that? I think that's fine. You know, that's it's, sure. Okay. Sure. All right. Yep. So yep. from my point of view, as I have said before, and I feel the people who are staffing Roseland right now are excellent, wonderful, you know, it's not about those people, but my proposals where we have a permanent person for Roseland who is, uh, who is there all the time rather than bar borrowing and taking from other libraries, uh, I would like to see that happen. And you have a proposal, and I can send it to you again. But that is a, um, and if you'd like that, just say so. But uh, so you started with me. That's where my priority is. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to Paul next. This is. Would you clarify what you're asking for? Okay. The if I, as I understand it, um, particularly in the last year. There was not a, an opportunity as the staff is putting together the budget for the commissioners uh, to basically say, as you're putting together the budget, would you please think about, you know, beefing this part up or thinking about improving IT or improving program or whatever, okay. so that when we are... I got it. Okay. So what I would say was I think that I'm completely happy with the direction that Brett has lobbied for and it moved us in. That's what I have to say. Okay, Paul? Would it be any surprise if I would uh, well, like to uh, be Let me a, think. Uh, oh. Literacy. Yes. <laughs> we just had a wonderful combining uh, of our literacy uh, tutors and uh, Literacy Works tutors. We had a training last Friday, and uh, there's a waiting list. Um, we have we're, we're a third time coordinator to do this, and and a, a part time trainer, um, and a huge need with a waiting list. And uh, I know it's not the biggest priority, adult literacy, but uh, so staffing, I, yeah, staffing. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I think that I'll just say that. Elena? Um, well, uh, as the appointee for the city of Sebastopol, um, and speaking of staffing, the Sebastopol Library has a crying need for a full-time children's librarian, uh, which would require just increasing the hours as a current children's librarian and adjusting Rincon Valley's children librarian's hours. But they have many programs that they'd like to do, and they're unable to provide those with the um, current staffing level. So that's my specific request. Overall, I, you know, I, it's hard to know what to adjust, and I think that you have the probably you and Ken, and your um, and your staff has a better handle on that. But I, I know that that children's librarian in Sebastopol should be full time. Thanks. Um. I, 
I, I'm sure that this is already in your uh, sights, but one of my idea, one of my thoughts is uh, thinking about the um, the early retirement benefit and the cutback in frontline staff. And I'm wondering if there's uh, a way to see if it's possible to start rebuilding that. Um, I was thinking about OPEB, but that's part of the thing. I agree with trying to f continue to fund Rosalind. Um, one of the things that I've become aware of um, recently is it's kind of related to the broad picture of program. But I think a piece of what currently is allowing us to do so much in program is the sub-budget. So that, for example, in Roseland, uh, the way the staff is being relieved to go to Roseland, to cover Roseland, is the sub-budget's covering subs for the places where there is a hole. There's also, uh, when I went to the Petit Luma Library on Monday, on, on LumaCon, the way LumaCon could happen and still have the library open was the use of the sub-budget. So uh, I would say as a broad picture of the, the budget in terms of supporting program, what is the list of sub-budgets related to that? That's my stuff. Oh, and could I just say one more thing? I absolutely feel that we need to put money into the OPEB trust. Which is already part of the picture, but that was as under you said. Okay, hello, Hillary. Um, I'm going to kind of echo Tim. I, programming is what I'd like to see supported more, if possible, but with awareness that that then touches on many other areas. But I think programming with Lumicon, with literacy, with children's programs is where we kind of reach out and get our um, users excited about our services. Yeah, I appreciate that one because right now 100% of our, you know, events budget either comes from the friends or the foundation and, you know, I thought that it, it might be time for us to establish a line item within our own budget that at least contributes towards classes and events. Reese? Um, there's a couple of different areas. One of them is staffing and I think continuing to move in the direction we started in with the making the um, staff wages, you know, have parity with other places so that they're equal and for the work they do, I think that was a good thing and I think we need to continue working on that. And I think addressing what Kim said, that focusing on increasing the revenue intake to accomplish lowering that uh, personnel in, you know, put input so that the percentage of what we're spending on that so that we can free money or have money to put into programs and things like that, I think that's an important part of it. And again, some of these things, you know, will take some time. It's not something that comes like a snap of the fingers. And finally, um, back to one of my loves, is you have to invest in order to reduce the, um, and, and create a, a good sustainable organization and so we'll need to look at and what we're developing in our initiatives is a program that we can develop so that it may cost us some initial investment but in the long run we're going to save a lot of money so those are the things in the sustainability side of it so those are the things that I was looking at and thinking about last but not least last but not least <laughs> Well, um, I, number one, really support our strategic plan. I haven't seen all the details, but what I understand is that there are a lot of objectives in the, and it's the branch managers are being asked to uh, look at the cost to implement some of the, the objectives. So I just want to support what it takes to, to fulfill the objectives in our strategic plan. We've gone through all this work. We're going to be out talking about it in the Speaker's Bureau. You know, let's implement it. And I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that costs. But anyway, I think it's really important. Um, I think it's really important to uh, fund our facilities. And, and we just have to gussy things up. And you know, I walked by Central the other day. And, 
you know, I was really glad that chips are there, that Ken got us last year, but you know, it just looks funky, and I just really want to do what we can to improve the facilities that we can improve. It just, it just, we need to look better. Um, I agree that we want to try to continue Roseland. Um, I'm a little bit confused about where we are. We did the $90,000 last year, and I don't know what we're doing this year, and it's not going to be enough money to have a permanent staff person there. So I, you know, I don't know where we're at, where we're at but I obviously I, everybody wants Roseland to stay open. I, I would like a report at some point in time about the hours because I understand the hours don't really work because of the conflict with the Boys and Girls Club. I don't know how long this temporary situation is going to go on, but you know we want to have more support. We want to have more access. We want to have people use the library. So, and and that's that the hours part really seems even more fundamentally important almost than the than the staffing part. Just you know in terms of people being able to use it. Well, it's the hours that were open are in conflict because of the Boys and Girls Club, so we can't be open because <laughs> the boys and isn't this roughly correct, Brad? Um, I think there's a problem with the subs, uh, as as has been mentioned, um, at least in Runner Park, and maybe just because we have a couple of staff positions that aren't quite filled, but I, they've had a problem even getting subs, and so I don't know whether we have a big enough sub budget or just have a hard time getting people with low unemployment as it is. So anyway, I know that that's kind of a problem for our particular branch. And um, the OPEB, which I don't pretend to fully understand, but I feel that we want to at least discuss not falling further behind. I would like to kind of draw the line and at least not build up any more liability. And it's my understanding that while we're budgeting them out, it's, the liability is actually increasing, not hugely, but a little, little bit. And I would like to at least meet whatever we need to meet uh, so that we don't increase the liability, if I'm making myself clear. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other after burn? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's all, it, and so everything that everybody has had, you know, has suggested takes money. And obviously the most important thing that we can do is raise money because, all, I, and really everything else is moot, you know? You're going to hit the wall and... Um, that's the reality, and um, thank you. All right, other commissioner comments, public comment. All right, if that was helpful. It was. Thank you. All right, moving on to action item. Um, we need to uh, change the wording of the motion. Uh, it says, I move that the Sonoma County Library Commission accept the basic financial statements for the year as amended um, with the changes that had to be made. So uh, moved. And given that change in language, uh, do we have a motion to, uh, yes, Reese? I have a question. On the um, agenda, it says that the That should be on the agenda. It should say 14 to 15 okay. audit, right? On the agenda, it does. That's correct, Eric Ken, the 14 15 ad yeah. audit. Okay, so I'm more correct. All right. So I just will be sent a copy electronically after it's. Corrected or not electronically? Or? Yes, well, okay. I'll get that uh, okay. when it's buttoned okay. up and taking the draft off. Yep. All right, thanks. I still have not yet received a motion. So you did? Oh, Linda moved. I'll second. All right, it's been seconded by Paul Heavenridge. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
And there being none, we accept the audit. The next item on the agenda is lab appointments, and I don't see any. The final one is uh, commission notes. Um, comments for commission notes. Um, this is, uh, I don't, there probably won't be commission notes for a while, I would imagine. Uh, but if there were, <laughs> I would like to suggest that we thank Rebecca for her service. Maybe not in commission notes, but had she been here, this is what I would have said. Thank you, Rebecca, for your years of service. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. And, um, and uh, so are there things people would like to uh, just mention for commission notes in case we do get them? The reason people are saying we're not sure there are going to be one is Rebecca leaves on Friday. We're not sure what the replacement's going to be, and perhaps it'll be something that the assistant does, but we don't have that person yet, so. The, the void is there. It's hard to avoid. Uh, so anybody want to add something to the notes? Uh, uh, Paul, did you? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the report on our, our uh, archives was kind of interesting. Maybe we can include that. Yeah. More than interesting. More than interesting. It was very interesting. <laughs> and that might be good to include. Along yeah, those lines, a slight tilt in the conversation, but we don't have our council protocols yet, or our commission protocols. Right. So I don't know how we request uh, agendizing an item, but I would like to ask the question because I would like to agendize the item of um, looking at the expenses related to maintaining the archive and going to the county with a, a request for funds. I would like to agendize that. It's a good idea. All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have been thinking about including it as the uh, on the form for the meetings that at the commission notes and or the option to place uh, or suggest an item for the agenda. Um, okay. Thank you. That's and part of that would be interesting to know what it costs if there is a way to. I mean, who's reimbursing our, you know, the miles and the time and the, uh, et cetera. And then the next thing is the fire alarm is going to, the water is going to, you know. Time's we need to find out what's going on with that. Times 22 years. So I, so I will say that David and Catherine and I have been doing a fair amount of talking wood over the last month or so about this. So there's several things that we're working on around costs and that. So it's at, at least know that your staff's concerned too and we're looking into these things as well. And certainly we'll put it on the commission agenda too. It's left over from when the library was a, a department. And it's, what, is it left over from that? No, no? I think it, they said it, she said it was left over from the tearing down of the courthouse and the building the new building. And yeah, like in the 70s or something? 1995. Yeah. So we'll, in any case... We'll, we'll put it on the agenda. Right, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other final item? I believe I can declare us adjourned. Thank you for your service.